All right. So welcome everybody um, to tree identification. Thanks for for coming out uh, as it such as it is. Um, my name is Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester, and I'm here. This event is co-sponsored also by Vermont Coverts and Vermont Woodlands Association. This is actually the second tree identification event that we've done because there was so much interest in learning how to do this um, at our first event. And so just quickly on, on who I am and what county foresters do. Um, in Vermont, there are 13 county foresters for the 14 counties and our role is primarily to assist private landowners in the management of their land and helping people understand how forests work and how we can manage them in a, in a more responsible way. Um, it's a really huge job. Part of that is because Vermont is about 75% forested and 80% of those lands are owned by private landowners. And we understand that uh, those lands, those private lands have massive public benefits. So they're supporting the quality of life of all of us. They're cleaning our air and cleaning our water and providing habitat for our wildlife, um, making Vermont a beautiful place to live, providing us opportunities for recreation um, and supporting the, the local economies of our communities. And so, it's really, really important that, that we understand how to manage them in a really good way. So that's what county foresters do. Um, I manage a program called the Current Use Program, the Use Value Appraisal Program in my county, which is a tax abatement program uh, for landowners with larger parcels of forested land. Um, I also work with towns in my county uh, to manage their town forests. And uh, I go out to uh, properties of all sizes, anybody who has a forest of any size from a couple of acres to a couple thousand acres, I'll also just go out and advise them about uh, how, to, how to manage your land and uh, how to be a good forest steward. And then finally, uh, the really exciting and, and fun part of the job is that we get to be creative about thinking about how to improve the, the health of forests and the quality of forest management in our county. And so from county to county, that can be really different. Um, and uh, how I address it in Chittenden County may be very different than you know some of the counties up in the Northeast Kingdom where the culture is very different, uh, the ecology is very different, et cetera. And so what we're doing now is just sort of um, in the service of improving your understanding of forests and trees um, with the hope that this will feed into um, uh, a greater appreciation for forests and then also better management of forests. And so one of the things that's really, really important about tree identification is it will massively uh, enrich your experience of being in the woods and also your ability to manage them. So it goes, you know, most of us, you know, without an understanding of tree identification, we'll go out in the woods and we see basically trees, you know, there's just a bunch of trees. But as you learn to identify the different species of trees, you start to see, oh, there's not just trees, that's maple and oak and ash and pine and spruce and fir. And it's actually this really complex dynamic landscape. And then you start to understand more about how tree species different, differ uh, from species to species and uh, their different attributes, the type of um, uh, things that they say about sites in our landscape just by being present. And so that's really important. And this is a time also when people are really valuing the time that they spend in their woods um, as an escape from just doing what we're all doing, which is being inside all the time. Um, and so I'm really excited to, to show you um, uh, admittedly quick uh, rundown of some of our most common tree species. And so with that, um, oh, fine, just some, um, just quick housekeeping. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there is, we're gonna keep everybody muted for the entire presentation. Hopefully we'll have a couple minutes for questions at the end. Um, so please do keep yourself muted. Uh, and if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a chat icon that will pop up. And if you have questions, put them in the chat box. And then Lisa and Kathleen will also be adding um, links that I might refer to and other resources into that chat box. With that, let's get started. All right, so this is a identification of common trees in Vermont. We're not gonna cover them all, um, but we're gonna get the important ones. And, and this is just a quick primer to get you started with the identification of our most common tree species. So one of the really important things to understand about our tree species um, and, and to make it more manageable to learn them is that you don't need to learn all of them. So in Vermont, we have about uh, 50 native tree species and that doesn't even include all the, what I would call town trees, those trees that are planted in our communities and, and in our yards, which could sort of be from anywhere. But as far as trees you're gonna see in the woods, there are 10 species that are the most common and they account for 85% of all the trees in the state. 
So on this list, you can see sugar maple, red maple, hemlock, white pine, yellow birch, American beech, white ash, red spruce, balsam fir, paper birch. Between those 10 species, you've got 85% of all the trees you're gonna see. All 40 of the other native tree species account for the remaining 15%. So part of this is just sort of making it so that you don't have to um, uh, look to a tree identification guide with 50 options. You can pretty much narrow it down to 10 options in most cases. One second. So uh, there is a, this is a really good book called The Beginner's Guide for Recognizing Trees of the Northeast. It's by Mark Michaelis. And uh, one of the things I really appreciate about Mark's approach is um, he will, you know, in the same way that we're saying, okay, let's narrow down the likely tree species that could be here. He's also saying, you don't need to know every tiny minute trait of every tree species. So basically, you just need to know a few charismatic traits that will get you to the identification of that tree. And so um, he describes it as recognizing trees because the way he approached it in his book is, you know, he uh, had friends, people who just sort of grew up identifying trees. Um, and they, they weren't, you know, they didn't have this, this complicated understanding where they knew what each individual attribute of the tree looked like. They just recognized them. And so he got sort of with those people to sort of drill down on those characteristics that allow you to recognize those tree species. Um, and so he doesn't overwhelm you with these different traits. He just gives you enough that you, that you need to know to learn the tree species. Um, I would also say, you know, tree identification books are, um, can be helpful. The tree identification books with pictures instead of drawing, drawings, I find to be less helpful. And the reason for that is because uh, a picture is just a picture of an individual tree species, whereas a drawing can sort of be an idealized version, which shows you sort of the more representative view of what your average tree of this species might be like. Um, so when you're looking for tree identification books, if you can find one with drawings, I like those better. Um, I also like the book Bark by Michael Wotek. Let's see here. So here's some terminology um, just that you'll, you'll hear me talk about. So this is an example of serrated leaves. So serrated leaves are where there's basically this, this jagged appearance all around the outside margin of the leaf. That's what's called serrated. Lobed leaves are leaves with these sort of big protruding sections that protrude off the leaf. Um, so this is a sugar maple leaf. This is an example of a leaf with big, three, you know, big lobes that you're looking at there. And then this is a beech leaf. This is an example of a toothed leaf. So a toothed leaf, rather than just having sort of a, a ragged, jagged uh, appearance all around the margin of the leaf, it just has these, these big outjutting teeth periodically around the margin of the leaf. Uh, I might also talk about simple versus compound leaves. A simple leaf, basically every other leaf that you've ever seen, like this one, is a simple leaf. The leaf is one piece, and you know that's a leaf as we all understand it. This is also a leaf. So this is a white ash leaf, but it's a compound leaf, which just means that, um, that those pieces that you're seeing, those seven pieces, are actually leaflets, and, and they comprise an entire leaf. So it's a little bit confusing, but you can tell um, if it's a leaf or a, or a comp or if it's a compound leaf or a simple leaf because of where the bud will be on the stem of the tree. So there'll be a bud at the base of every leaf um, and not at the base of every leaflet. Another uh, terminology uh, uh, series of terms that you want to get straight is hardwoods versus softwoods. This is just sort of used in the vernacular. Um, hardwoods just refers to deciduous trees, broadleaf trees trees that lose their leaves in the wintertime. Softwoods refers to coniferous trees, which are generally trees with needles, trees with cones, trees that retain their leaves in the wintertime. And with all these things, uh, trees are dynamic and, and weird. And so there will always be exceptions to these rules, but these are sort of the broad leaves. Um, the hardwood trees are what we call angiosperms, flowering plants. Um, softwoods, uh, coniferous trees are what we call gymnosperms or non-flowering plants. Opposite versus alternate branching. This is the, the one trait that it seems like everybody who teaches tree ID really, really focuses on. And, and what this just means is that, uh, and this is only a trick that is good for hardwoods, for broadleaf trees, um, basically means that when you're looking at a twig on opposite branched tree species, um, two twigs will come off the, or two, two leaves or two twigs will come off the twig or the branch opposite one another. So directly opposed to one another, as you see in this drawing. Uh, 
and alternate branch tree species will not do that. They'll, they'll be uh, staggered across the, the twig or the branch. Um, there are only two native tree species um, that have opposite branching. So maples and ash are those two tree species. There are shrubs and there are also non-native tree species, um, which are also opposite branch. But as far as native tree species you're going to find in the woods, uh, maple and ash are the two that will do this. Um, unfortunately, this is not a characteristic that is always useful because in many cases we're identifying trees, uh, we don't have a, a twig to look at, or we can't see all, all the way up in the tree if it's opposite or alternate branched. But if you do, this is a, a good characteristic, especially to identify maple and ash. So we're gonna start with some hardwood tree species here. And the first one we're gonna start with is sugar maple. So, Sugar maple bark um, is a brownish gray. Um, it is rough, even when it's young. So even if you're looking at a small sapling, what you'll see is that the bark will have a, a warty, roughened appearance. Um, it will always be sort of almost sandpapery to feel. And as it gets older, it will break up into these sort of larger chunks, um, sometimes with the suggestion of vertical plates but it doesn't really have a pattern bark. So it will just sort of be warty, chunky, um, and, and this brownish gray appearance. It will sometimes have this whitewashed appearance. So sometimes, and this is not, this doesn't always happen, but uh, sometimes in sugar maple woods, you'll see all the trees have this um, really, really distinctive sort of white coloration. It looks like someone slapped a bunch of white paint on the tree. Um, and they'll all have that. And sometimes uh, in stands where this is prominent, you can identify the sugar maples from a long way away just by looking at that whitewashed appearance of their bark. Their bark will never be shaggy. And that's a really good trait for um, differentiating them from red maple. So you should never be able to like pop a piece of the bark off. Um, the bark is very, very thick and will be very tightly held to the stem and it will never look shaggy. Um, so one thing I'm gonna talk about with a lot of these tree species is buds. Um, buds are good because buds and, buds and bark, those two characteristics, you have all the time. Um, with the exception of what the, the springtime when those buds are now leafing out, but in the summer you'll have them again. Um, these are characteristics that you can use when you don't have leaves, basically. And so uh, when I talk about buds, the bud at the tip of the twig is called the terminal bud. Um, and, and the buds that you'll see farther down protruding from the sides of the twig are called lateral buds. So the, the twigs of sugar maple are this sort of nut brown. They're often speckled white. Um, they are, it's one of those opposite branch species. So as you can see, those lateral buds coming out from below the terminal bud are coming off exactly opposite the twig from one another. And that terminal bud to me looks like a bishop's hat. So it's this just sort of pointy, appearance that looks like a, like a bishop's hat. Um, the leaves on sugar maple, um, you know, this is sort of the, the really um, iconic picture of that, of that Vermont, um, you know, sort of that Vermont maple symbol, right? Uh, the leaves are lobed, so they have these, the, these big, what, what are called palmate lobes, um, and they have basically five major points. So they have, so one, two, three, four, five. So you can see that there are some minor points, but as far as the major points of the leaf, they will generally have five like that. And what you'll also see is that on the margin of the leaf here between these points, the, the leaf margin is smooth. So this is a good characteristic for differentiating again between sugar maple and red maple, because on red maple, the margin of the leaf will be serrated all the way around. So it'll be serrated all the way around there. Um, you'll also see that this area between the lobes, which is called a sinus, is shaped like a U. So you can remember U for sugar. That's another good comparison with red maple, which is shaped more like a V. All right, so this is, you know, again, this is sort of this iconic symbol um, in our state. Ironically, a lot of the times we see a maple leaf, um, people have actually depicted a Norway maple leaf, which is a state-listed noxious weed. It is a, a horrible invasive species. It's also planted in many yards and along streets. And the reason they do that is because a, a Norway maple leaf has just a, even a more ornate appearance with, with basically like seven major points and these, you know, it just has this sort of very beautiful striking uh, leaf profile. 
um, but it's not a sugar maple leaf. So I always sort of grin when I see that. So another time you'll see sugar maple trees and you can sort of, there are characters, like, so you can identify these tree species from the characteristics they have. And sometimes you can also identify them situationally. So where you'll see a lot of sugar maple is growing as what we call wolf trees, these big, massive, hundreds of years old trees with these huge lateral branches. And you'll see them, they'll be very striking in your forest. So they'll be like these, you know, much younger, smaller trees, and then these just sort of huge charismatic uh, wolf trees. Um, and those will often be sugar maples. So what they used to do is basically, uh, you know, most of Vermont, 68% of Vermont was cleared in the 1800s for pasture, and they left sort of these evenly dispersed sugar maple trees, which would be shade trees for livestock, and that they would also tap in the springtime. And as a result of that, there's no trees competing with them, so they develop those big lateral branches, and they uh, take on a really weird appearance. So here's some, here's my sugar maple wolf tree montage. If I can make it work. They are absolutely striking. That is a selfie. Uh, I propped a phone up in a tree and set a timer, and then I had to go run and jump in the crotch of that tree because I had to get a picture with it. That's, I think, the lar second largest sugar maple in the state in Williston. All right, so what most people will confuse uh, more than any other two tree species is sugar maple and red maple. And they're actually really different, um, ecologically and otherwise. So the bark on red maple, when it starts, when it's young, remember sugar maple when it's young will be very sort of rough or sandpapery, warty. Um, red maple will go from being perfectly smooth, so smooth blue-gray bark, to being very shaggy. And so, you know, and this is an example here of the shagginess of that bark. And so remember, uh, sugar, sugar maple bark will never be shaggy. It will appear broken up, but you should never be able to just like pop a piece of the bark off. Um, and it's very easily to do, easy to do that with red maple. So the bark is very thin. It will be very sh uh, shaggy. Sometimes you will see, and it's hard to depict this in a picture, um, but sometimes you will see the, the um, so it will appear like a target face or a bullseye in the way that the tree is broken up. So you'll see a spot and there'll be these concentric rings around that spot, which is a really good characteristic for red maple that you can see slightly in this picture here. Um, mostly it's a non-patterned bark, so it's not symmetrical. It'll be broken up sort of randomly in these shags and chips like you see in that picture there. Um, and that's just an example of, of how shaggy and chippy the bark can get. And again, when it starts, when it's young, it'll be very, very smooth, bluish gray. And so if you look at a, a shaggy tree and you're not sure if it's a red maple or not, but you know what that young red maple bark looks like because it's bluish gray. And with any of these tree species, if you want to know what the young bark looks like, just look up the tree because the bark higher up in the tree is, is going to be that young tree bark. Uh, my teacher, John Shane, would say, uh, use the whole tree. So the buds of red maple are also distinctive. So remember sugar maple buds uh, are that nut brown with the terminal bud that looks like a bishop's hat um, and their twigs are brown as well. Uh, red maple twigs are red and their buds are red and round. And what you're seeing in this picture is actually a cluster of buds. So that's um, a terminal bud and then also a bunch of floral buds. And in the wintertime, sometimes you can tell if it's red maple because if you look up into the canopy of the tree, uh, you'll see these bud clusters, which will look like a, a fruit at the end of that twig or like the, I say like the end of twigs have been dipped in wax. So there'll be a bulge at the end of every twig and no other tree species will have that. The leaves are also distinctive. So remember with sugar maple, there's basically five major points. With red maple, usually there's one, two, three major points. But better, a better characteristic than that is just noting the margin of the leaf. So the margin of the red maple leaf is serrated all the way around. That's like your foolproof red maple versus sugar maple. Red maple is serrated. Other characteristics are that the three major points and then also that this sinus right here, remember on sugar maple, that's a U. In red maple, that's a V. And these leaves are also, um, that you can see a little bit in this picture here that the underside of the leaf is much lighter than the, than the upper side of the leaf. And also in the spring or in the fall, they'll turn bright red. Oops. Um, 
as far as their form, when you see them, they'll often be multi-stemmed. So multiple trees coming out from, from a single stem that can either be uh, just sort of the way they grow and they can also sprout from old stumps. So sometimes a sugar or a red maple tree will get cut and you'll see a lot of stump sprouts come up from that and eventually those will become sort of multiple larger stems. Um, the difference ecologically in, in, in what we call their silvics in forestry, the way they grow, uh, is pretty um, stark between these two tree species, surprisingly. So sugar maple um, is very long lived, easily capable of living 250 or 300 years. And it's um, a, a little bit of a specialist. So it only wants to grow in these what we call like sweet soils. So soils with a lot of carbon or uh, uh, calcium and magnesium and other minerals that, that, um, that make it really easy for trees to grow. Uh, You'll see them in combination with like uh, white ash, uh, basswood, some of our other what we call rich site tree species. Um, and they're a shade tolerant, so they're capable of growing in the shade in the understory of the forest and gradually sort of working their way up into the canopy. Uh, by contrast, red maple is a generalist. It can grow like in swamps. It can grow just about anywhere. It is very fast growing and it is somewhat intolerant of shade, so it needs a bigger opening. It's not going to be happy in the understory. Um, it needs more light, um, and uh, and it can you know it just sort of is um, less of a dominant long-term tree species. It'll live to be 80 to 100 years old as compared to 250 to to 300 years old. Um, you will see tree species that look like this a lot um, that are planted or in floodplains by the side of a river. Um, a look-alike with red maple is silver maple. And if you see what looks like a red maple when it's planted, it's probably a silver maple. So if it's in someone's yard, um, and that's also true if you're in a floodplain, if you're by uh, the Lamoille or the Winooski River, um, you'll see that there will be these big, what look like red maples, and they're actually silver maples. The buds are the same, the bark is effectively the same. White ash. So White ash, the main characteristic, there's actually two big ones, but the main characteristic of white ash is the bark. So white ash, you know, in, in comparison to sugar maple and red maple bark, which doesn't have a distinctive pattern, isn't symmetrical, white ash bark is perfectly symmetrical and even and regular. And it's comprised of these thin interlocking ridges. It's this white, whitish, ashy gray color and to me, those ridges interlocking and, and crossing with one another look to me like uh, interlocking diamonds. Um, they are all, every ridge is about the same size. Um, and the pattern is, again, completely regular and symmetrical around the tree. Um, that's a really, really distinctive bark that, that, you'll, that once, you, once you look for it, you'll see that it, it is very, very identifiable throughout the forest. The buds of, of white ash um, are very distinctive as well. Um, they are fat. So <laughs> you can't see it from this picture because it's not compared to another tree species. But when you see the crown of white ash compared to the crown of, of any other tree species, the bud or the twigs look huge and clumsy and thick. Um, the, they are another opposite branch species. So you can see those lateral buds coming off uh, opposite one another across that twig. That terminal bud, I've always thought of as looking like um, Jughead from the Archie comics, looking like Jughead's hat, where he wears that like weird crown thing. Uh, someone also told me recently, which is I really like, that it looks a little bit like a chocolate chip. Um, that's a very distinctive terminal bud on this one. They have a, a compound leaf. So basically, they're, that is, even though you see those seven leaflets, that is their leaf. So when you look up in the canopy, there's just a lot of little mini leaves everywhere. And it has sort of what I think of as a jungly appearance. I don't know if that's, so that's looking up into the canopy of a white ash tree. And just because of all those little leaflets, it just has this sort of very distinctive bamboo-like, jungle-like appearance to me. And this is the other really, really good characteristic of white ash. So you can actually see in this picture um, compared to the trees on the right, how much thicker and fatter these branches are. And you can see very clearly the way that the, each twig is coming off the branch at pretty much an exact 45 degree angle from the one across from it. Um, so you can see that opposite branching and you can see the fat fingers. And um, it looks a little bit like, a like an old radial antenna for your TV. 
So once you get this characteristic, you'll be able to see an ash without leaves from a mile away. Um, this very, very distinctive fat fingers looking like a radial antenna with that very, very distinctive opposite branching. I should say white ash is, um, we have three, three native species of ash. All of them are currently under threat from the emerald ash borer, which we expect to kill uh, most of them and is sort of slowly working its way through our state. And there's all these, um, you know, it's, a, it's an important tree species in a bunch of different ways, commercially, ecologically. Um, really, really hope that uh, we're able to get through this emerald ash borer um, infestation with some remnant of our ash populations because it's a really, really special tree species. Uh, so this is a, one of those tree species that probably most of you know and can identify and you don't really need all the characteristics for this one. So this is an example of you can just focus on a couple of charismatic right in your face characteristics and you'll be able to identify it. And with white birch, it's the bark. Um, also called paper birch and the bark is white. It is peely, um, peeling in these broad horizontal sheets that look like sheets of paper. Um, and with these horizontal dashes, those are lenticels, they aid um, the tree in basically gas exchange from its trunk. Uh, and so you will never miss this. It's the only tree species where the bark is gonna be that stark white and peeling in those big broad sheets. The leaves, they're, they're serrated. Um, again, I'm just telling you just as an FYI, but this isn't probably the characteristic that's gonna help you identify it. Uh, the twigs may be warty, so sometimes if you run your uh, fingers down the twigs, it will be, there'll be um, sort of uh, appearance of like sandpapery. They'll be rough against your fingers. You'll feel those little warts. Um, the other thing uh, ecologically is that white birch is a tree species which uh, needs big openings to grow in. So it's, it's intolerant of shade. It's very fast growing and it's very short lived. So, you know, we would expect a, nor a white birch under normal circumstances to live like maybe 60 to 80 years, sometimes even less than that. Um, and if you see white birch, because it's so intolerant of shade and needs big openings, if you see white birch in your forest, usually you'll see there's a bunch and they're all about the same set size and the same age. And that means that there was a large disturbance in your forest sometime in the history. Uh, of your forest. So basically, if those trees are 40 years old, 40 years ago, something big happened. It could have been a natural disturbance, could have been logging, something like that. Um, but those trees would not be there if there hadn't been a large opening in your forest at that time. You can also infer with a lot of these tree species, so white birch will only have branches at the very top of the tree. You can infer how tolerant these species are of shade by where they're likely to hold their branches. So species which are very tolerant of shade, like American beech, will have branches like all the way down to the ground. And sugar maple will have low branches in many cases because they're also tolerant of shade. Species like uh, paper birch will only have branches at the very top of the tree. So another gimme uh, is yellow birch. And it has many characteristics like white birch. Its bark is also peely. It's also distinctive. It's also broken up by these horizontal lenticels, those horizontal dashes. But instead of being white, it's this metallic golden color. Um, and instead of peeling in these broad, flat sheets like paper birch, it'll peel in these little thin shreds. So um, white birch bark, another uh, amazing use for it is it's really, really good for starting fires. You, probably, you guys have probably started fires with it when you're camping. Yellow birch is okay, uh, but is nowhere near as good because it just comes off in these thin little papery, foily sheets. And again, the, you're, in most cases, you're only gonna need the bark because there's no other tree that's gonna have golden metallic bark in the woods. That's what they look like when they're young before they get peely. They still have um, the golden, that golden metallic color, although it'll be a little bit more uh, sort of coppery. Uh, the twigs you usually don't need, excuse me, you usually don't need, but um, it is another good characteristic. Like apples, uh, the, the twigs are often born on these things called spur shoots. They're just these like mini, mini twiglets, these like little short fat twigs. And sometimes when you look up in the canopy of, the, of a, a yellow birch, you can see those, those spur, spur shoots, little mini twigs sticking off everywhere. Another characteristic about their twigs that's really neat um, which we used to use when we we're identifying small trees, trees that we didn't have good characteristics for, you know, good bark characteristics or anything like that, 
is you can scratch and sniff them. So if you just take your thumbnail and you scratch a little piece of that bark off one of the twigs and you smell it or taste it, um, it smells and tastes exactly like wintergreen. Um, and so it's this really, really distinctive thing. It's actually kind of nice to chew on a yellow birch twig sometimes uh, when you're in the woods because it tastes really, really good uh, and it smells like wintergreen. So if you have a twig, um, that's a characteristic that you can use. It's, uh, it's twigs are, uh, or I'm sorry, it's leaves are serrated around the margin. It's actually what's called doubly serrated. So it's sort of serrated roughly and then serrated around the serrations. Uh, in the wintertime, you'll see that it looks like up in the tree there are cones. And what those are is basically um, just an aggregation, a collection of, of seeds. So these little seeds, they look like a bird's foot. Sort of, I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, they are designed to basically disperse over the surface of snow. So yellow birch in the wintertime, they'll be holding onto them. They'll gradually drop them and the seeds will blow across the surface of the snow. Um, the seeds look like that. So a lot of times actually when snow starts to melt, you'll see these little guys everywhere and it's just yellow birch seeds. And the final characteristic that I really like about yellow birch uh, is that it often looks like they have legs or like they're doing a dance move. And the reason for that is because yellow birch really, really um, is good at growing on disturbed soil and growing on rotten wood. And so what they'll do is a yellow birch seed will land on a piece of rotten wood or a stump, as, in the, as is the case with this picture. It'll eventually grow roots around the stump and put them into the ground. And then the stump will rot away and leave this tree that looks like it's standing on legs. And um, because it's so good at growing on dead wood and it's so good at growing in dispo uh, disturbed soil, it's often an indicator of past logging. So logging creates lots of both of those things in many cases. Um, and so if you have a bunch of yellow birch and they're all the same age, often that is another indicator that, uh, that something happened that many years ago. So if they're all 40, you can infer that your forest was probably logged 40 years ago. In some forests, you'll actually see a ton of yellow birch that look just like this because they're all growing on old stumps. American beech. So American beech um, used to be one of our most prominent tree species. We think that prior to European settlement, uh, it was 40 to 60 percent of our total forest cover. It is much lower than that now for a bunch of reasons that I'll talk about in a second. Um, the bark of American beech is supposed to be this smooth gray, what I learned as elephant skin bark. So this perfectly smooth bark. It's bark that uh, when people carve their initials in it, you can see them like 40 years later. I've seen literally initials from the, and dates from the 70s carved in American beech bark that is still legible. Um, unfortunately, American beech is, is suffering from an a exotic disease complex called beech bark disease, uh, which affects the quality of its bark. So a lot of times when you see it, it looks more like that. Um, pock marks, what I call like tree acne, sometimes bl a blackish uh, pocked appearance like that. Uh, beech bark disease is introduced in the early 1900s um, and basically kills beech trees um, and stresses them out. And uh, that is expressed, the effect of beech bark disease is expressed in their bark. So um, sometimes you will, so there are uh, resistant beech trees and beech trees that are resilient to beech bark, bark disease. And you will still see that nice elephant skin bark, um, but just as often or more often, you'll see this sort of uh, pockets of elephant skin bark, but then also this sort of pockmarked appearance, sometimes on the same tree. The buds are very distinctive. So I learned these buds as buds that look like a cigar that a mouse would smoke. They are very long and they're very thin and they're very pointy. And they're longer and thinner and pointier than any other bud that you're gonna see in the woods. They look like they poke your eye out. Really, really good characteristic in the wintertime. Uh, the leaves are also distinctive. So you see that there's those veins or ribs on the leaf. Um, at the end of each one of those lateral veins, those veins going from the center out to the margin of the leaf, there is one tooth on the end of each vein. So there's one tooth on the end of each one of those veins. They're the only tree species that does that. They have beech nuts. These are nuts that are really, really valued for wildlife. Um, they're spiky and, and kind of funny looking. Um, everything eats them. Bears eat them. Birds eat them everything, deer eat them. Um, when, they, when they mature, they, they, they become this sort of light brown color. And that's one in my hand that's uh, 
that's been broken open and there'll be actually four little nuts inside that chamber. And sometimes you'll be able to see, even to the winter, you'll be able to see either the, the old beech nuts or just the, that, that spiky hole um, hanging on in the, in the upper canopy of the beech tree. Oh yeah, so some bears love beech trees and actually bears have a, a really interesting connection with them where you'll see these beech trees that just are covered in bear claws. That's what, that's what the tree you're looking at is. Um, other beech trees that seem to be healthier seem like they should also be loved by, be by bears. Um, they will not have claw marks. And there's been research that's done on this. Some beech trees are just culturally important to bears where they, they will teach their young to climb on them. They'll climb them year after year after year. They'll come and just sort of visit them and walk around them. Um, whereas other beech trees are just, for whatever reason, not as important. Um, so this bear, these bear claw marks on beech can also be a good diagnostic characteristic. And then finally, when they're young and they're in the understory of the forest, they will often hold on to their leaves throughout the winter. Um, and they will be this sort of papery, uh, yellowish color, yellowish, tannish color. And if you're walking through the woods in the wintertime, you might also, you might actually hear them rattle. So they'll be rattling around and making this sort of interesting sound. Um, quickly about beech, you know, many, uh, the role of beech has just really changed in our forests uh, over the past 300 years. Uh, again, from being this incredibly dominant tree species to being um, one that is really, really does not grow in that way anymore because of, largely because of beech bark disease. Um, another reason for that is because they're uh, very, under normal circumstances, very long lived, capable of living many hundreds of years and very, very tolerant of shade. So in our pre-European settlement forest, large disturbances were uncommon. And so what happens when large disturbances are uncommon large, you know, big openings, big mortality events of trees are uncommon is that these trees that sort of play the long game ultimately become dominant. So like all the faster growing trees that also live less long will grow and decline and their beach will be in the understory just sort of hanging out, waiting for opportunity and will just exist under very low light conditions and work its way up into the canopy and then, and then be there for hundreds of years. Um, you can see that uh, many old timber frames, even though beech is not a great timber, many old timber frames are made with beech posts, presumably just because it was at hand. Um, and so now, you know, after our whole landscape was cleared, essentially in the 1800s, um, it would take a long time for beech to become dominant anyway, but because of beech bark disease, it doesn't really grow that way in most cases anymore. So it gets stressed out um, and it dies. And one thing that beech does when it's stressed out is shoot up root sprouts. So it, it's really good at shooting up clones from its root system and they're stressed out because of beech bark disease all the time. Uh, beech has become a little bit of a weed. Um, it is considered as such by foresters in some cases because um, it never grows or rarely grows into a healthy tree species. So obviously we don't want to grow unhealthy trees. It also um, shoots up all those sprouts so it can be very difficult to, to encourage the regeneration of any other species and deer don't like to eat it. So deer will eat all the other stuff. They don't eat the beach. And what you end up with the confluence of all those factors is can be a beach monoculture where you can't grow anything else. Um, and so it's something that, that foresters often struggle with because we all wanna grow, we don't wanna, we wanna grow beach, but we don't wanna grow a monoculture of anything. We wanna grow a diversity of native tree species and beach can make that very difficult. Um, finally, this isn't on your top 10 list, excuse me. But it is, in parts of the state, a very common tree species, northern red oak. Um, if people in Vermont talk about oak, they're probably talking about northern red oak. It's by far the most common oak species that we have. Um, its bark is a, a bluish chrome gray. Um, it's actually very distinctive how dark it is compared to other tree species. If you look through the forest, you'll see that it's just a real dark bluish chromey, darker shade of gray than the other tree species that'll be next to it. It breaks up in a way that is, is somewhat patterned. So it's not fully random like a red maple. It's also not as regular and symmetrical as a white ash, but it breaks up into these broad flat ridges. It looks like ridges have sort of popped out of the bark and they've been sanded off. So these broad flat ridges, I've also heard them described as ski trail bark. So it looks like the way that ski trails, if you're looking at a mountain that has a ski area on it, the ski trails join and then they branch outwards. It looks a little bit like that. Um, in the cracks between those broad flat ridges, 
will often be a, a little line of orange or, or reddish color. So you can see that in the picture here. Um, and that will be there from when they're very young. This is an example, it's a bad picture, but an example of what the bark looks like when it's young. So it's that dark chrome gray color and it can actually be shiny. And as it's increasing in diameter, it's stretching the bark and it's creating those vertical orangish reddish cracks. The buds um, of red oak are pointy, a little bit like, um, a little bit like uh, sugar maple. They look a little bit like uh, fish scales or like, like lizard snake skin or something like that. Um, and they're clustered at the end of the, the twig. So at the end of the twig, there'll be usually three uh, large terminal buds at the end of each twig. The leaves are very distinctive with all of these big lobes, each lobe ending in a pointy tip with a little falcate hair, just a little, little basically pointy tip. Um, it looks like flames or like waves. Um, some people remember it by, by saying, okay, so red like fire and, the, and the, the margin of the leaf looks like flames, but it's a very, very distinctive leaf. Um, can be shiny. The, the leaves are actually what we call polymorphic, uh, where the, uh, the leaves from the top of the tree will have much, be much more incised, much uh, bigger sinuses between those lobes, and they'll be really leathery and shiny, and the leaves from the lower down in the tree will have more shallow sinuses, um, smaller lobes, and be much more sort of tender and broad. They've got acorns. So these acorns are really amazing food sources for all different kinds of wildlife. Red oak are um, what we call a mass tree species. So they uh, produce a seed which is valued by many different species of wildlife from bears to deer, to turkey, to squirrels. Um, they interestingly, uh, they do not produce acorns every year. They produce them usually every two to three years. And it will actually be coordinated over a broad geographic area. And so the thought is that if they produced acorns every year, it's such an amazing food source for many of these species of wildlife that the wildlife species populations would increase and they'd be able to eat all the seeds. But if you starve those populations for a few years and then produce a like double, triple load of acorns, you'll overwhelm their ability to, to eat your seeds. Even so, um, even with that masting strategy, coordinated by all these trees, we think by probably aerial uh, pheromone signals, uh, even so, most of acorns are eaten before they can get a chance to sprout. Um, so probably, I think it's 50% of all acorns never make it off the tree. They're parasitized before they get off the tree. Once they get on the ground, 98% of them will be eaten or destroyed before they get a chance to sprout. But if they do get a chance to sprout, that acorn is basically a little energy packet that the red oak seedling can feed on. All right, moving on to some of our softwood species. Remember, hardwoods, deciduous, broadleaf trees, softwoods, trees with needles, evergreen trees with cones, usually. <laughs> Most prominent um, uh, softwood tree species is eastern white pine. Most people will call all softwoods, not most people, some people will call all softwoods pines. When in reality, there are pines that are also softwoods, but then there's also many different other species uh, within, within the coniferous trees that are not pines. Um, so eastern white pine um, is one of our most prominent softwood species. It's probably historically the most culturally important uh, softwood species because when European settlers first came here, that was the thing they were struck by was these, the massive size of these pine trees, which at that time were an extreme naval asset. So they wanted them to be, uh, to be used to basically be the masts on ships and to also build ships at a time when, when naval dominance was very important in Europe. Um, and that the initial wave of resource exploitation from New England was largely based on cutting these big white pine trees. Um, so the bark, is purplish brown, usually broken up into these, these vertical plates. Um, when it's young, it will be more of a, it'll be more of a, a slightly metallic green color. It branches in whorls. So what whorls are is when they're just branches arranged in a circle around the circumference of the stem. And if you count the whorls on a white pine tree, you can tell how many, how many years old they are because they put on about one whorl per year. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard that, that uh, white pine, 
has uh, the needles are in bunches of five. So W H I T E white five. That's correct. I also learned when I was a kid that red pine were in bunches of three. So R E D three. Uh, it's just not true. Red pine is in bunches of two, and I have no idea why why that came into uh, the sort of culture our cultural knowledge. But it's it's not true, and but seemingly everybody has heard that. Um, because these needles, so these needles are very long, they're very thin and delicate. Um, they look like needles, um, like a sewing needle. Um, because of that, the, when you look up into the canopy of a white pine tree, often it'll have this, this soft, fluffy, cloud-like appearance to my eye, whereas some of the other conifers, uh, the, the needles can look sort of hard, spiky, and intense. This one looks very soft and cloud-like. Many, so the way that white pine trees historically would grow would be to be a single gun barrel like straight stem with branches basically at the very top. Uh, when white pine trees are grown in the open, such as in these old fields, which is where most of our white pine is growing right now, is they just happen to be really good at growing in old fields, uh, they get attacked by this native insect called the white pine weevil, which attacks the terminal bud, the, the top bud of the tree, um, and makes those lateral buds try to become the new terminal bud. So instead of a single straight stem led by that terminal bud, you'll get multiple stems coming off it. It looks a little bit like an octopus or something. Um, we call these cabbage pine, old field pine, bully pine. Um, and more often than not, I feel like I see pine like this. They have pine cones, long slender cones that are about five to seven inches long that you guys would all recognize. White pine trees, many times when you'll see them now, again, because they were planted in plantations in the early 1900s, um, and because they grow in these old fields, you'll see them as like a monoculture. Uh, it'll be just like all white pine, all of the same age. That's not really up here. That's not really how they grow normally, but that's in many cases how you'll see them. Um, and, and like some of these other tree species, you can infer, like you can infer that there was a harvest or a, or a natural disturbance, you know, 40 years ago, if you have a bunch of 40 year old white birch, if you have a bunch of 60 year old white pine, you can probably infer that that was a field 60 years ago. And that's why that's there. Eastern hemlock, I love this tree species. Um, the bark, so I know that I'm describing all the barks as like some variation of like green, or I'm sorry, of like brown and gray but hemlock bark is brown. It's just straight up brown. It's the brownest bark out there. Um, and it will break up into these vertical, looking vertical plates that will look sort of chippy like that. They're not, you shouldn't actually be able to pop pieces of the bark off at all, but it'll have sort of that chippy appearance. The needles are short, like half an inch to three quarters of an inch long, slightly tapered at one end. One of the things that's, that's different about hemlock versus all of the other conifers, uh, with the exception of cedar, which we're not going to learn today, except with the exception of, of cedar, is that it uh, grows in a way that is not uniform at all. So the, the needles will grow in a completely sort of random way off the twigs. The twigs will grow in a random way off the other twigs, and the, and the uh, branches will grow in a random way off the trunk. It's not symmetrical, it's not patterned, it's just sort of everything growing everywhere. So if you see a, a branch like that, it's a good indication that it's a hemlock. That's what they look like on the underside. They have these two little white stripes called stomatal bands. Little teeny tiny cones, half an inch long. You will identify hemlock more often than not based on the type of forest that they're growing in. So, uh, you, when you walk into a hemlock forest, you will notice it because it suddenly gets dark, um, it gets quiet, and there's like nothing growing in the understory. Uh, hemlocks basically create these really shaded environments because they're really, really shade tolerant, and it's a way of making it so that pretty much nothing but hemlock will grow in those areas. Um, it's just really fascinating to see how they sort of exert this control over their environment. And if you have walked into a, a hemlock forest, you probably said, whoa, this is really nice. You know, it's just sort of this appearance of like calmness and peacefulness and darkness and kind of coziness in there. Um, they grow very slowly. So a lot of times you'll see these big hemlock trees, a tree growing next to it that's, you know, a big hemlock tree that's 20 inches, a tree's growing next to it that's five inches. They could be the same age because hemlock can grow, grow so very slowly in the understory.
Uh, my teacher, John Shane, said looking through a hemlock forest, he, he said it looked like purple haze. So it's just sort of, you look through this sort of dark, thick, dense, not, not dense, but a crowd, uh, intact, continuous canopy, uh, shaded environment, and it just sort of looks purplish. All right, two more. I think I got time for these. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to teach you spruce as uh, through the three different species of spruce that you're likely to see kind of all at once. All spruce trees have spiky needles, which are angular in cross section. So you can tell they're angular in cross section versus flat because you can roll them between your fingers. So if you take a spruce needle, you can roll it between your fingers. You'll also, if you like grab onto a spruce branch, it'll be spiky, it'll prick your hand. And so a, a, a way of remembering that is spiky spruce. Um, the bark in, in every case will be broken up into these sort of round, it'll be chippy, broken up into these roundish little chips that you know you could sort of brush your hand against and, and, and uh, break them off. The branches are in whorls, like white pine. Um, the three species you're gonna see are red spruce. That's our most common native spruce. That's the one you're likely to see in the woods. Uh, that's an example of it uh, in, that, in that topmost picture there. If you see a spruce tree that looks like this, um, so that's a Norway spruce. Uh, that's a tree that's planted ornamentally in many cases, um, and then also was planted a little bit in plantations throughout the woods. Um, so you'll see them in the woods a little bit, but they're not a native species and they won't grow on their own in most cases out in the woods. Uh, the characteristic for Norway spruce is these pendulous branches. So it just looks like they're melting off the tree, these twigs hanging off the tree. It's called pendulous branches. And that's the characteristic that's gonna get you to Norway spruce every time. That's sort of all you need. They also have these big cones, which look a little bit like um, that animal uh, pangolins or like an armadillo or something, the scales. Uh, and those are the uh, grandfather clocks were made in, in the Black Forest of re region of Germany, and they actually modeled those counterweights on grandfather clocks after those. So that's why they look like that. And finally, blue spruce. I don't like blue spruce all that much. I don't think it's a very good looking tree, but other people must because it's planted in everybody's yard. Um, it's a spruce tree, it's blue, it's bright blue, you can't miss it. Um, you, you definitely have seen a few of these uh, walking around any neighborhood. And finally, balsam fir. So in contrast to spiky spruce, the needles of balsam fir are flat. So you can say flat fir or friendly fir. Um, they are longer. They're like an inch, three quarters to an inch long. They're attached to the twig with something called a suborbicular leaf cushion, which you don't need to know, um, but it's just a fun thing to say. It's a little suction cup is how the twigs are, or the, the needles are attached to the twigs. The bark is very, very distinctive. So it's this semi-metallic mottled bark, which will go from the, it'll be this basically like uh, metallic -y gray to this sort of light blue splotchiness. Um, and on the bark, there will be these little bubbles that you can see in this picture. Those are little bubbles of pitch. Fur pitch actually used to be a commodity that was collected. They used it to glue together lenses of microscopes and stuff like that. And people would take a long stick with a tin cup on the end and pop these pitch blisters into the tin cup and collect them and sell it. Um, it ha it's also antiseptic, used to use, be used by native people on wounds. Um, also, if you stick a little teeny tiny twig in it, uh, in those pitch blisters, and then you put it in a pond or a little puddle or something, it'll go around like a motorboat. Just a little, <laughs> a little tree ID uh, uh, trivia for you. The cones are interesting. Uh, they're, they're sealed by pitch, so you can see they're covered in pitch, and they're born only at the very top of the tree, born upright on the, on the twig. So every other cone you're gonna, you're gonna see is hanging from twigs and branches. These are born upright. You can identify many of these conifers by form. In this case, um, you'll see that the fir trees have this very, very steep, thin, steeple-like appearance. So you'll see fir and spruce growing together in many cases. Spruce will have a more rounded top and fir will have this very, very thin steeple-like appearance. In Ch you're gonna see this on the top of mountains in Chittenden County. Uh, in other parts of the state, it's much, much more prominent. Um, and you'll also see it sometimes in these old Christmas tree plantations, which uh, never got harvested. 
But in Chittenden County, that's, that's the only place I see it. But then as you get into colder parts of the state, you'll see it much more prominently, especially growing with fir. So with that, I think that's it. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and just take a couple minutes for questions. So if you have them, please, um, please put them in the chat box. So it looks like no one has a question yet. So we'll wait for a moment. Great. Oh, there you go. Bill wants to know if you can talk about striped maple. Striped maple, yeah. So striped maple, I hear old timers, loggers, they call it striped maple for some reason. It's also called moose maple. It's also called moose wood. And so that's a, a species which is common in, in some circumstances. It never gets very big. It usually will only be about probably maximum size would be two or three inches in diameter. It has really weird bark. It has like bark that is patterned with this sort of, it looks like an alien tree to me, like this alien green black patterned bark. And not a long lived tree species. Um, you know, I, I think it probably lives 10, maybe 20 years maximum in the understory of the forest. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting, an interesting tree species and a really weird looking one. Okay, someone else, Andrea, would like to know how she should tell the difference between white oak from red oak. So, I mean, one of the big ways you're going to tell it is, so there's three, three different species of white oak that you're going to see. One is white oak, straight up white oak, Quercus alba, and that's one that you'll see in really warm sites, sandy sites, south-facing slopes, stuff like that in the Champlain Valley, um, more of an upland tree species that you'll see mixed in with red oak. Um, that, that one will have shreddy, or not shreddy, but sort of loose, uh, chippy, ashy white bark. Very, very distinctive. The buds will still be clustered on the end of the twigs, but they won't be pointy, they'll be rounded. Um, you're, that tree species is uncommon, so you're not gonna see it nearly as much as you're gonna see red oak. There are also two other species which are white oaks, so they're in the white oak group. One is swamp white oak, one is burr oak. They are very difficult to tell apart from one another. And these will be species you'll find in the Champlain Valley. So in Chittenden County, this would be in like Charlotte, uh, Western Hinesburg, places like that. And, uh, and those would be growing as a bottomland species. So with hemlock uh, in, our, in our Champlain Valley clay plain forests. And those, again, they'll have the ashy white bark, which will be very loose and chippy and sometimes almost in these big blocky kind of sheets peeling off the tree. And in many cases in the Champlain Valley with heavy soils, like where we have the Virgen's clay, um, where the, the water table is very high, you'll see that instead of sugar maple, they left burr oak or swamp white oak uh, to be those shade trees. So the, those big, huge wolf trees that are in the middle of our forest will be those species instead. Great. Um, Judy asked that you could just give a quick little summary on larch. Larch. So larch is one of those species that where I was like, softwoods lose their, or softwoods keep their needles in the wintertime, mostly. So we do have one native species of, of, of softwood, um, larch, also called tamarack, also called hackmatack uh, by some, or hardhack by some, uh, which is a deciduous conifer. So it is a conifer that loses its needles, and it confuses the heck out of everybody because everybody thinks it's dead, and then they cut it down. It turns out it was just a perfectly healthy larch doing what larches do. Uh, I don't see it in Chittenden County, but in other parts of the state, it's very prominent. And you'll see it in the, um, in the fall. It's beautiful. You'll see these like beautiful, long, delicate yellow needles um, at the time that the, other, the leaves of the trees are changing. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool tree species as well. Also sometimes planted in plantations, Japanese large mostly. So someone would like to know the difference between oak and poplar, the bark between oak and poplar. So the, the best characteristic, so I know that, you know, what this person's asking is that when you look at the lower bark of an old poplar tree, it can look oaky. So it can have those sanded off ridges. It will not have the line in the crack between those ridges of reddish, orangish color. Um, and it usually the, the, the bark, the lower bark of those poplar trees, when they start to break up like that, will be more of like an ashy grayish color instead of that, that beautiful chrome blue, blue gray. But the best way to, to, tell, to tell aspen, poplar, same thing, um, 
for sure is just look higher up in the tree. So aspen, poplar, whatever you want to call it, um, higher up in the tree. And, and when it's a young tree, they'll have this very creamy, uh, greenish cream to like orangish, greenish cream bark. Um, it's like a little bit, you know, if you're looking at it from a long ways away, it'll look a little bit like white birch bark, except it's not peely. And it, and again, is not white. It's that sort of creamy color. Um, so just look up in the tree. And if you see that creamy colored bark, you'll know it's a poplar. All right. Someone to know if Norway maple and sugar maple can cross pollinate and what that might do or be. <laughs> oh God, I hope not. Um, I, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think so. I've never heard of anything like that. Um, they could maybe be crossbred, but uh, I would hope they wouldn't be because that would put put the fear of God in me for the, the future of sugar maple because Nora maple is such a virulent invasive species that we're trying to do away with and I love sugar maple so much. So I don't think so though. Okay, I'm um, we'll just take a couple more questions because we want to wrap up on time, um, yeah. be timely. Um, someone wants to know if it's wise to plant elm in Chittenden County again. You could, I mean, so there, uh, so American elm is a species which is, was devastated by Dutch elms disease, an invasive disease, um, which afflicted many elms in the, in the beginning part of the, the 20th century. Used to be an incredibly common tree that lined our streets and they have this amazing sort of like martini glass bouquet of flowers appearance. Um, and they would, uh, in many cases, those big broad lateral branches of the elms would, were said to have met in the middle of the street and created this cathedral-like appearance as you're walking down these old streets. And you can actually, from their form, you can identify elms in these old pictures. Um, and they all got killed by Dutch elms disease. Um, and so they don't grow that way anymore. And so what you'll see is that elms are not extinct. They still grow uh, in Vermont. They just grow to a sort of smaller size and, and become reproductively mature. And then they get attacked by the disease and, and die. There are people who are, and, and the Nature Conservancy is one of them, who is trying to reestablish disease-resistant elms um, that you can plant and, and also that you can reintroduce into the wild because my main concern would be just getting this species back into our ecosystems because we can't just continue to lose uh, species from our forests. Um, and so there are disease-resistant elms out there that you can plant, but I definitely wouldn't just plant any old American elm because it's almost surely going to die. All right, I got two quick ones and then uh, this is a yes or no. Can black spruce be found in Vermont? Yes, um, there's actually, so if you're in Chittenden County, so I know that up in the kingdom it can be found. Um, it's a, nor so we're on the southern end of its range. But when I was in dendrology class at UVM, uh, we went up to Colchester Bog in Colchester, you know, in the Champlain Valley in the warmest part of the state. Uh, and in the Colchester Bog, there is like probably the northernmost black gum in the state and probably the southernmost black spruce, and they're like 10 feet from each other. That's the only black spruce I've ever seen in Chittenden County, but there are definitely more in Vermont. All righty. Um, that about does it for questions. There's a couple more, but I'm going to ask them to email you because they're a little uh, ubiquitous. For Yes, and, and so um, I'll say, uh, yeah, please do email me. So my email is ethan.tapper at vermont.gov. Um, if you'd like to be kept apprised of the different webinars and events um, that I'm doing, you can get on my email list. And what you can do to, to get on that is to just email me and I'll put you on it. I would also really, really recommend if you find this kind of programming interesting, try uh, follow VWA, Vermont Woodlands Association and Vermont Coverts on social media, subscribe to their e-news. And all of us are just trying to, to get you all um, access to really, really good programming during this time. Um, and so I would really, really strongly recommend, and I know that some of our other partners are too. Um, VLT is also offering some, some really interesting workshops. So I'd recommend also connecting with them. They're doing one about uh, white cedar and what's the other one, Angie? Oh, oh. It's on wildflowers. On wildflowers um, coming up. So definitely also check out VLT's offerings and other partners like Audubon Vermont, um, the Vermont, North Branch yeah. Nature Center, Northwood North Stewardship Center. Just keep looking. You'll keep find looking. something you like. Yeah, there is lots of all, you know, and we're all on the same team. Like there's just lots of really, really good work that people are doing to try and help you understand um, 
how these how our ecosystems work and, and how to protect them and manage them. So with that, I wanna thank you all for coming and thank Lisa and Kathleen for helping organize the event. Um, thanks very much. Bye all, thank you.